Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How are you all? Well, welcome, welcome to the second of these Etoki Suna Iraikis forums. So welcome, as I said before in Basque, to the second session of Etoki Suna Iraikis Forum, which is a joint initiative led by the Gipuzko Provincial Council and the University of the Basque Country. What's the point, what's the aim of this encounter? Well, to share the future challenges of Gipuzko with society and to reflect on them together uh, with people who have different characteristics, reflect on them uh, with experts, non-experts, uh, young and old. And of course, this is what we're going to be focusing on this evening. Now, I'm sure that most of you who are here would agree with me if I said that we're living in uncertain times, right? And in fact, uncertainty was the theme of the first meeting of this forum. This first meeting of this Etorquesunereikis forum. It's true that these are complex times in which we have the feeling that a lot of the values or the pillars that have really shored up our society in the past are being lost or they're at risk. And often, I think we often wonder, where is there room for dialogue? And even so, where, what, what, where does that leave intergenerational dialogue, um, which is so important? A dialogue between people who are young, some of you are here today, it's you who are going to have to face the situations and the problems of the future. Uh, so the intergenerational dialogue between young and old. Because no matter how old we are, we all face common challenges. And it's really important to get involved. Because the more we get involved, the more we engage, the better solutions we'll come up with. But as you know, getting people to get involved uh, isn't always easy. But we're here. We're here today. We're here and willing to learn and to listen. The Gipuzkoa Provincial Council has a strategy called Etorkis Unereikis, Building the Future, which aims to promote a shared and open governance model. And that uh, this encounter forms part of this strategy. So that's the aim of Etorkis Unereikis, Building the Future. And so we're all here today to do that, to build the future. And uh, today we have some top tier speakers, some very, very good speakers who will give us some ideas about how to promote this participation, especially among the younger generations. But before we hear them, we're going to first uh, welcome Agustin Erquicia, who's the Vice Chancellor of the Gipuzkoa Campus of the University of the Basque Country and the President uh, of the Etorque Sune Iraikis Forum, and he is going to come up here to just say a few words of welcome. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Mr. President of the Provincial Council, uh, politicians, authorities, friends, uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome. Uh, welcome and welcome to this second session of the Etorque Suneiraikis Forum, a forum which is organized jointly by the Gipuzkoa Provincial Council and the University of the Basque Country and also Mondragon University. In the previous session, we were able to see how this uh, initiative works, what dynamics it has, and today's program uh, is following the same format. Now, the issue, the theme, chosen for today is intergenerational dialogue, an issue that no, I, I think there can be no doubt generates a lot of interest among citizens uh, and generates a lot of questions to which we don't have the answer, unfortunately. But I think despite that, we really do need to foster a measured calm reflection because this will help us to find spaces of consensus which will hopefully mitigate the anguish and the anxiety that uncertainty so often generates. Today, there are a lot of there's a lot of uh, inequality, and there's a major gap between the younger and the older generations, the youngest and the oldest 
generations. And in fact, this is what uh, we say in the little handbook that we prepared for today. Now, based on that idea, the, today's session will feature the following uh, events. We're going to see a video, first of all, with people from different generations. From he, he, uh, f excuse me. From her privileged position as a manager in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs of the United Nations, Willie speak to us about the keys to age discrimination and intergenerational dialogue, proposing some good practices. Isabel Garatuta Coponencia Rengañea. So, as after the presenta uh, Isabel's presentation, we will have a short Q&A session and we'll be listening to two people who have participated or participated in the video. Then we're going to have the opportunity to get to know a real intergenerational experience which has been carried out in one of the municipalities of Gipuzkoa. And then finally, all the way from Geneva, we're going to have um, two members uh, connecting up over the Zoom platform. They're two members of an NGO who are carrying out uh, projects involving young people and children. So I wouldn't like, I don't want to finish without saying thank you to all the people who have made this possible. The President of the Provincial Council, the students from the three universities, University of the Basque Country, Deusto and Mondragon University, who participated in the different recording sessions, the working team made up uh, by Ander Arzairius, John Muñoa, Fernando Tapia, Amaya Zubizarreta, Peyo Gutierrez, and Mikel Mancisidor, and of course all of you who are here today for so generously giving us your time. So, without further ado, let's get going, and uh, we hope you enjoy the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Vice-Chancellor Agustin. So, now let's uh, see this video that you mentioned. As we did in the first session of the Torque Sunia Iraikis Forum, we're going to be screening a very short video. It's a 12-minute video in which students from different generations talk in a very open and calm way. So, uh, you will be able to hear them. They are students from Dosto University, the University of the Basque Country, and Mondragon University. So, they're going to be having intergenerational dialogues and thinking about <laughs> the intergenerational gap. Yo tengo dos hijas y veo que I have two daughters, and I can see that their evolution has been different from mine. Getting a permanent job, earning a decent wage, making your way in life, it's a lot harder for them than I think it was for us. And then the issue of housing, that's a constant concern. Because everyone has the right to a house, and this is what the law says, but then it isn't put into practice, or there are English subtitles, so I will stop translating for you now. Vamos, en los, primeros, en los próximos 10 años todavía, eh, ni comprando una casa, ni mucho menos, o sea... Yo para qué tengo dos carreras, tres másteres, cuatro idiomas, para terminar haciendo X trabajo que está poco remunerado o mal remunerado, entonces eso te quita las ganas de, de estudiar. O sea, es triste, ves gente de, de, de 29, 30 años que todavía están viviendo en casa. Ni casuneta na divide se ukine que en arasota cogada la eche visita la emprecarioa esta abuela benetan esta abuela aurreiten barreto aurreries serva y falta da la hori aurreiteko Komunika bidaietan gutxi azaltzen zerate gazteen problema gutxi azaltzen da hor bai badagoela benetako arrakala nik uste gizarteak gazteak ez ditula ondo tratatzen zuen aldeko oso oso gutxi egiten dugula Iruro biurtetik gorako, iruro gita bosturtetik gorako jendearen zako egiten ditugu eskari batzuk eta zuen aldeko eskakizunik ez da egiten. Pero eh, yo el otro día estuve en una manifestación en favor de Osakidecha o me, que me mejorara la, la situación con Osakidecha y demás y no había jóvenes, había poquísimos jóvenes. Yo no veo, a mí no me dan motivos para seguir 
ni votando ni luchando por una causa que creo que es justa. Me siento estafado, me siento engañado. Yo creo que nos, nos preocupa todo un poco menos. Como vivimos en general bien y no nos falta lo básico, que a lo mejor antes había más, más necesidad o más represión en algunos temas, pues yo creo que ahora pues eso, hace que la gente se relaje un poco. Antes la movilización era muchísimo más física, pero yo creo que hoy en día todo, como ocurren tantas cosas y nos enteramos de todo, si hay algo por lo que manifestarse suele durar muy poco. Está claro, tú has nacido con el smartphone debajo del brazo y, y, y yo con el pan, ¿no? Claro, ¿Cómo era? Sí. Con la barra, ¿cómo era aquello, no? Sí. Entonces, ese es el problema que tenemos y eso sí que de cara a nosotros es, para, bajo mi punto de vista, uno de los mayores handicaps. Y eso también ha hecho que los diferentes puestos de trabajo tengan que cambiar, se tengan que rediseñar sí. y, y eso hace que igual la gente se haya quedado en un nivel más atrás. Sí, que es verdad que lo que más me impresiona es la rapidez con la que las cosas cambian uh -huh. en estos momentos y cómo te puedes ver desbancado rápidamente. Parece que el, eh, cinco años por detrás tienen unas, eh, unos, unas habilidades que a ti te faltan. Uh -huh. Esa sensación eh, genera un poco de angustia. Dentro de poco parece, dicen que los coches quiero decir, que van a ir solos, que no va a haber ni conductor. Quiero decir, ¿en qué va a trabajar todo el mundo? ¿Qué vais a hacer? ¿O ¿Qué va a hacer la juventud con tanto, voy a decir el término, no quiero ser peyorativa, el término viejo, mayor, quiero decir, pff, no sé, ¿de dónde van a salir las pensiones? ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo vais con vuestro futuro laboral? ¿Cómo la caja de pensiones? ¿Cómo...? cómo eh, ¿Cómo se va a poder pagar? ¿Cómo vais a llegar vosotros con las condiciones tan precarias que tenéis a poder eh, cotizar lo suficiente como para poder tener un futuro más o menos decente? ¿Cómo hemos podido llegar hasta aquí? Eso es lo que no entiendo. Pero sin embargo hay cosas que, que se nos han ido de las manos y, y de repente nos encontramos con que, bueno, ¿y ahora qué? ¿Qué ¿Cómo lo veis? ¿Cómo, cómo lo afrontáis? O sea, la verdad es que... Mal. Yo aprecio mucho que me hables de tú a tú, pero, por ejemplo, si yo te hablo a ti de manera condescendiente porque pienso, ah, es una persona mayor, o tú haces lo mismo conmigo porque piensas que soy joven y que no voy a... que, que no tengo la misma experiencia que tú, que no la tengo. Por supuesto. Pero, pero no, hace, uy, no hace falta que, que eso se haga evidente ¿no? en el discurso. Hasta aquí cerra, te recuerdo en Villera o Tatic, hasta baño. Naico no queda nada bien en Nera, le tic, sube que custea, ni bien sabe, es una sátira, ni le gusta la cogenda, baño según ni vais, comenta tu duda en Nera y Guruan, va a ser Villera que ni tú en, va a ser Tat que ni tú en, va a ser Garbi Utsidiate, va a ser Gastén Andi, que es tu gaudela. Ni custe dot, se reenvía cosas, ¿no? Es galería, es Ana Pruat, eta, ni custe dot, va, hola co. Eh, ba, el carris que está con la cobillera eh, veneta no su interés garris a día la gure que es que compartió eta va va a generar sino va a vestir y sea portable que ni cursi eta va eh, bueno va solución a topar eta gastía cal de batetí que está el dúo agua de este batetí goya se muevan esta esta abuela va le cubat Danak el carquetaco, verba y teco, gausa iriburus. Yo observo que estamos, eh, ambas generaciones, eh, estamos en el mismo escenario, jugando en el mismo escenario. Y así como nosotros. Parece que estamos esperando a ver qué van a hacer ellos con nosotros, pero yo creo que sí hay una parte importante que todavía nosotros sí podemos hacer. Hoy en día yo tengo 65 años y yo creo que con 65 años en este momento eh, me encuentro con facultades suficientes para ayudar, por ejemplo, a gente mucho más joven que vosotros. Sí, por esa parte también nos sentimos nosotros apartados en el sentido de nos están pidiendo tener experiencia cuando no nos están dejando tenerla. Sí, nosotros en ese sentido reconozco que hasta, 
habremos sido incluso egoístas. A nosotros, cuando, cada vez que nos planteaban, cuando venían gente joven en el trabajo, gente joven con ideas nuevas, deja como está, que eso funciona, hemos sido muy, muy conservadores, eso ha sido claro. La longevidad es, eh, ahora llegamos bien, está, somos capaces, ¿por qué no se nos aprovecha? Yo creo que es algo que ya que nos están oyendo supuestamente las instituciones o nos estamos dirigiendo a ellas, pues me gustaría decirlo. O sea, porque bueno, ¿cómo? ¿Canalizarlo cómo? Ya no sé, pero... Entonces, los jóvenes tienen que estar representados por los partidos políticos sin pertenecer al partido. Eso es lo que quería comentar, ¿no? Que integrarse en este mundo, intentar cambiar, no voy a decir el sistema, que parece muy idílico todo eso, ¿no? Pero cambiar las formas de hacer las cosas que tiene la política, la administración. Eso es que, es que llevamos... El, el discurso que nosotros con 50 años escuchábamos, seguimos escuchando el mismo discurso, los mismos discursos en la gente que nos, que nos dirige. Eh, ¿No usted gastas con un problema etaniza te va a tener o sartenais? ¿No está más que nada en Shaitan y en Pichat en Tiazenda? Es aquí que Google Sasco no la funciona. Ni que usted tore de que ni angaste va a tener proceso a darla, ¿eh? Si casten soy ya se la urtía pasa y quien doy a ese niño y me va. O sea, sin sana ya. O voy a urte que ya mundo a naja que ya. Eh, honest, eh, iruro que quimoan, ahora imposible a dar. Adivides ni de inguruan, asco y que usted activismo político, asociación asco de adivides, eche visita a Nataola, mañana guiada, irutes a Itela, y que usted y Teula va de este tema va a tener va a ser un partido a Vesela. Esta aquí no la he explicado. La ver con Anura va activismo político y mañana partido perrilla exhorten a Azteco. Mañana tal día va a Daudela, pensamos en un político a Badaola, es Gaudé representa otra política, anda Ori o la da. Y que usted suele que va a Ori. Conservamos. Estamos bien, de acá una de acá, un do Gaudé, ser tacoso se verría. Pero llega un momento que hacen tope. Porque las grandes decisiones, esas que hay que cambiar para que vosotros, pienso yo, eh, podáis, eh, digamos, despegar, ahí es donde, donde, donde se para, donde no se os permite. Que es posible que seamos nosotros los que estemos frenando. Eh? Mucho también en las redes sociales, que eso también tampoco lo veis, y es mucho más fácil hablar, hablar en las redes sociales. Pero hablar en las redes sociales, al final, ¿a qué te conduce en la práctica? O sea, todo ese tiempo que dedicáis a todo este, esta, este vamos a llamar progreso, que sí es progreso, yo no lo dudo, pero luego eso, a la calle, a la gente de pie, por ejemplo, a mí, no sé a mis compañeros, pero eso eh, no llega. O sea, sí, se escribe en el anonimato, yo digo tal, yo hago cual, pero ¿y cómo subo? ¿Cómo paso? ¿Cómo llego más arriba? ¿Cómo llego a que me oigan? No sé cómo decir. Eso es un poco lo que yo veo que no... que se queda ahí. Ay, la gente que de ahí, las caula estímulo asco. Esta persona tiene saco rechazo de auquitea. Estímulo eroso bat, ba, TikTok, bezala, eh? bezala, bezala, edo sare sozialak, edo seriak, ba, gaur egun bezala, Netflix, ahí zer, despiste hoiek, ba, horrek ite gaitu, pixka bat, benetako prekupazutatik an, alden du pixka bat, ez da? Eta nola zuek zuen garaian, ba, gien entzintu zen hainbeste despiste, pixka bat, errealidadea, munturen aurrean zen uten, eta horrun horrek igual inara zidu zuek pixka bat gehiago mobilizatzea, eta hoi, ez da, eta guk, ba, gure mobilizazio gehiena gatzen dea, ba, Twitteren, esango nuke nik. Well, I think that's given us some food for thought, right? And we'll probably come back to some of the things that they've said uh, throughout the course of today's session. We're going to start now with, we're going to hear from our international expert and then we're going to have some uh, conversations after that. And we all hope that you will, you will participate. We're eager to hear your questions. Um, you can send them to us through the Gipuzkoa Events app that you can download to your mobile phone. So, very interesting reflections, interesting ideas that I'm sure we'll be coming back to throughout the course of this session. How we can foster intergenerational dialogue to 
reduce the intergenerational gap. Now, we would like to invite someone who's been deeply involved in the organization of this meet- meeting, Mikel Mantisquido. Mantisquido. <laughs> Mantisquidor. It's a bit of a hard surname to say, I apologize. Mikel Caixo. Mikel, hello. You're going to be telling us a little bit more about this meeting, right? Well, there's always a a silver lining to every cloud because it was great to actually see a little bit of the video about uncertainty because I think it's refreshed our memories, right? Yes. Now, of course, you can see that what we're doing has some kind of logical chain to it. There's some kind of logic behind everything that we're doing. So uh, what, what, what should we expect from today's session? So we'll pass the floor to you. Thank you very much. Vanessa, President of the Provincial Council, um, colleagues, friends. Good afternoon, everyone. So yes, today, as uh, Vanessa has just said, uh, this is the second session. Um, first of all, we focused on uncertainty and today we're focusing on intergenerational dialogue. So let's start at the beginning, right? What is intergenerational dialogue? Uh, it's always important to, you know, all of us, for all of us to agree on what we're talking about. Now, I'm sure there are uh, things, uh, there are things, we have things in common with uh, intergenerational solidarity, uh, different responsibilities, uh, opportunities, participation, engagement, all of these things are connected, of course. But once we have decided what we're talking about, we, the next step would be, okay, is it useful? Is intergenerational dialogue useful, necessary? And what's it useful for? Uh, what's it going to help us in? How is it going to help us? Now, these are questions that we're asking ourselves. Um, and they're not idle questions by any stretch of the imagination. They're very necessary questions. And if the responses to this, the answers to these questions are affirmative, so yes, it is something that we're interested in, it is something that's going to be useful, the next question will be, well, how do we go about doing it? How do we practice it? How do we um, not practice it? I'm sure we practice it every day, but how do we improve it? How do we improve our practice? Uh, if we want to have a better society, a better governance, if we want to have a greater degree of intergenerational dialogue, how should we go about that? And uh, how should we do it in institutions, in politics, in governance, in society, in associations? Which is why we have organized this event, this evening event, with some guests who are going to help us to answer this question. I mean, there's no definitive answer to these questions. No one has the definitive answer but they're going to give us some clues and some tips that will be helpful for us I believe from the most general level to the most specific level so the general vision is going to be offered by Isabel Legare I hope I've pronounced her name correctly and apologize if I haven't she's the uh, she works at the division of the UN which is responsible for social affairs and she is, she heads up the youth division uh, and also uh, works on the issue of intergenerational dialogues at the UN. And she's going to help us to identify uh, sort of how you can see this issue from a, most, from a global point of view. I mean, what's more global than the United Nations, right? So uh, how is the United Nations, what's it doing to tackle this? And, and how, what, what are the, the general overview of this? Um, and what are they doing in different countries? What are different experiences? She's going to give us a very global overview, a general overview of the issue. And then the next step, we'll be moving from a more global vision to local experiences and practical experiences. So how we try to put these large scale principles into practice, obviously with our mistakes and our errors, but with our achievements as well. And this is why we have two fantastic practical cases, very specific case studies that we're going to be um, sharing with you this evening. We have uh, the intergenerational dialogue in Legazpi. And of course we have the mayor of uh, Legazpi, Koldobike, Olabike and Maria Ruiz 
who's been helping with the organization of this experience. And they're going to tell us about what they've been doing, what they've learned on the way, which is always very interesting. And then we're going to have another experience, another practical experience that uh, we're going to uh, hear about online because unfortunately they were unable to be here in person today. But this is an international organization with headquarters in Geneva, Child Rights Connect. And they're experts in organizing spaces, in organizing events in which young people, children and adolescents can work towards identifying social challenges and improve working to improve policies. We have Lady Ibanez and Agnes Gracia Corbero, who I actually met them in an event in Granada not, uh, not, uh, not long ago, and they know all about child participation and youth participation in public policies. So we've got a very exciting evening ahead of us. We're going from the most general to the most local, and uh, I think the best thing that could happen would be that at the end of this evening's session, uh, our vision will have been enriched. Our vision of intergenerational dialogue, hopefully it will be enriched and hopefully we will have uh, picked up some tips, some recommendations, some ideas about how to put it into practice more efficiently in, each, in our different areas of expertise. Thank you very much indeed. Bueno, so now it's time to give the floor to Isabelle Le Garé. Welcome to the stage. very much for being with us. I give you the floor. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I will have to address you in English because uh, my short stay in San Sebastian hasn't allowed me to <laughs> learn the local language yet. So apologies also for the weird accent. French is my mother tongue, so that's why I sound a little bit um, funny in English. So thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this Building the Future event. It's an honor for me to be here amongst you. I very much look forward to learning uh, from you, and I hope that my uh, presentation can help you, um, your work and your thinking on the topic of intergenerational dialogue. I must start by saying that intergenerational dialogue um, is something that I'm really passionate about. I'm delighted to see that this topic is gaining some traction at the local, national, and to some extent, uh, at the global uh, level as well. Um, so for the last 24 years, I've been working on youth development and international, uh, intergenerational dialogue, two topics that go hand in hand. I'm a social anthropologist, and I joined the United Nations system in 2008, and I worked on youth um, development in a number of UN entities. Since 2018, I've been with the Department of Economic and Social Affairs um, in the division that works with social groups who might be in vulnerable situations, including young people. Um, we are working more and more on intergenerational dialogue. Just over the last three months, we already had um, two events, one with member states and one with uh, civil society. And more is coming uh, when it comes to intergenerational dialogue at the UN because the UN Secretary General is calling for this to become a priority, and I will talk a little bit more about that um, later. In the division where I work, uh, most of our time is spent on two fronts. First, we are advising member states on how to develop um, sound policies on youth, for youth and with youth. And to do that, we do a lot of research and analysis to support the development of evidence-based policies. And that informed a little bit my presentation. And second, we support meaningful youth engagement, especially in decision-making processes at the local, national, and global levels. And in the division where I work, we have um, programs that support uh, meaningful youth engagement in uh, decision-making processes at the UN level. Uh, so I'm here today to share with you what I've learned about the topic of intergenerational dialogue since the beginning of my career, and I hope this will be um, useful to you. That's just like, okay. So my presentation uh, today has three portions. So first, I would like to talk a little bit about ageism, because ageism is a key obstacle to inter intergenerational dialogue, and intergenerational dialogue is needed to combat ageism, so it's a little bit like the chicken and the egg um, issue. Second, I will discuss how intergenerational dialogue is a potent tool to address a wide array of challenges we face today, especially when it comes to building a sustainable future. I will also introduce the concepts of intergenerational solidarity and intergenerational equity. 
And lastly, I will share a few thoughts on good practices for intergenerational dialogue with a focus on the political and the policy spheres, as well as share a couple of examples that have been done by others. So let's start with talking a little bit about um, ageism. So age is one of the first characteristics along with gender and ethnicity we notice uh, about other people when we interact with them. It is one of the main aspects through which we categorize people. And when we character, character, categorize uh, people according to age or generations, we might end up having stereotypes, prejudice, or discriminatory behaviors against them on the base of, of, the base of their age. So this is ageism. The concepts of age and generations are ways of dividing up people in society according to birth period and biographical times. And that can be helpful or necessary on certain fronts. Uh, for example, I'm glad that I can tell my 10-year-old daughter that no, she cannot go to the movie theater with her other 10-year-old friends because she doesn't have the legal age. So it's very useful in this context. And she will immediately respond that as a 50-year-old woman, I'm so uncool. So that's okay, so <laughs> we have to deal with these, um, these concepts. Um, so generation exists as familial or kinship structures that tie grandparents, parents, and children to one other, another through relationship of exchange and interdependence. In other words, generations are seen as groups that support and depend on one another through informal or informal uh, contexts in direct and indirect ways. However, Age and generations do not define a person's uh, identity and abilities, and generations are not homogeneous social categories. Yet, they are given similar attributes thanks to ageism. And the concepts of age and generation are often compelling enough to be used as the foundation for policy framework and, so many, and many other decision-making processes. And this is how ageism makes its way into politics and policy making. And this is why I would like to spend a little bit more exploring this topic. So what is ageism? Ageism is composed of three things. First, the stereotypes, how we think. Second, the prejudices, how we feel. And third, discrimination, how we act toward others, or even ourselves, based on age. So let's go back to stereotypes, meaning how we think. Age stereotypes are internalized and used to guide our thinking on people of a specific age group. For example, thinking that um, older persons are not good with technology or social media is an ageist uh, stereotype. And I've learned that the hard way when I asked my father if he knew, my 86-year-old father, if he knew what was TikTok, and I was met with a big <sighs> So, you know, we're all, <laughs> we all internalize uh, these age stereotypes. Second point when it comes to uh, prejudices, this is related to how we feel. So being fearful when you see a group of teenagers hanging out outside in the street and you cross the street to avoid them because you're feeling fear, you think that they're gonna be violent, that's an ageist uh, prejudice. And third example, not hiring someone because of their age is an ageism, disc is ageism discrimination. Also preventing young people from holding a seat in government, uh, for example, because they are not meeting the minimum age to get elected or the age of candidacy is ageism discrimination. We're not born ages, of course, but it starts early and it is reinforced over time. Children as young as four year old are aware of their culture's age stereotypes and prejudices through the stories that we tell them, through what they see on media, on TV, or through um, family culture. And soon they internalize these stereotypes. And ageism is very prevalent, it's deeply ingrained and more socially accepted than other forms of bias such as sexism and racism. So where is ageism? Ageism can be self-directed, interpersonal or institutional. Self-directed ageism occurs where, when it is in, internalized and turned against oneself. For example, last week I had to learn how to use the Canva software and it took me quite a long time before I got to the, the task because I was thinking I'm too old to learn a new software. So you can direct ageism uh, toward that. Interpersonal ageism arise in interactions between two or more people. Uh, for example, in family setting, parents can tell their kids, you know nothing about this, just be quiet. 
Um, institutional ageism refers to the laws, the rules, the social norms, the policies, or the practice of institution that unfairly restrict opportunities and systematically disadvantage in individuals because of their age. For example, mandatory retirement age is a form of institutional uh, ageism. Who says that after 55, you're no longer able to work? I would like to add a few more things about institutional um, ageism because it's something that has a huge impact on society and especially young people. Often people fail to recognize the existence of institutional ageism because the rules, the norms, or the practices of an institution are longstanding. They have become ritualized. They are seen as normal or the way things are done. And we heard a little bit about that in the, in the, in the video. Therefore, while not intentional, institutional ageism can legitimize the exclusion of people from power and influence, reinforcing asymmetric power structures that is based on age and age-related assumptions. So ageism is widespread around the world. It denies people of their human rights and the ability to reach their full potential, including in politics and governance. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about ageism against youth, but I need to reiterate first the fact that ageism uh, affects all age groups. Uh, but ageism against youth is not talked about sufficiently in the public sphere. Ageism against uh, youth manifests itself across a range of institutions, including the workplace, the legal system, and politics. Ageism against older person is better documented than ageism against youth. For younger people, we have limited data. Um, I hope it's going to change soon. But one area of research that is increasingly um, getting looked at uh, over the last few years is the exploration of how ageism affects uh, young people in politics. Findings indicate that um, there's a tendency to doubt, deny, or dismiss the voice of youth, regulate their identities, we tell them who they should be, and generally limit the, their efforts in political and advocacy movements. And we heard about that also in the, in the video. So we'll come back about uh, on the topic of ageism against youth in politics in a minute. But before, I would like to share a slide about uh, Europe. So this graph is only about uh, Europe. So in Europe, you can see that younger people report more ageism than other age groups. So on the left-hand side, I don't know if you can see, it's 15 to 24. Um, so it says that 55% of youth from 15 to 24 are reported being treated with lack of respect and 41% being treated badly. So if you go to the other side of the graph, the older persons, they are the second group who report the most ageism. So it basically says that in Europe, youth are the social group who reports the most ageism against them. So and Europe is the only region for which we have, we, can, we have data to compare ageism against, uh, between groups. So hopefully that will change soon. We'll be able to have a better idea of what's going on uh, globally. Okay. Um, so now let's go back to the topic of um, ageism against youth in politics. The issue of ageism against youth in politics translates into young people under 30 years old, making up to 2.6% of the world MPs, member of parliaments. Around 25% of the world single and lower houses of parliaments have no MPs under 30 years old. And 73% of the world upper houses of parliaments have no MPs age under 30. So close to 70% of countries make a distinction between the legal age to vote and the legal age to be eligible for a political position. So that's the voting age versus the eligibility age. The legal age to be eligible for a political position in the upper chambers range from 18 to 45, with an average age of 26.6 years old. This means that on average, you'd need to wait 10 years, so between 18 and 28, to be eligible to hold seat in upper chambers. For the lower chambers, the average waiting time is shorter, around 3.5 years. So it's interesting to see that youth are okay to vote at 18, but they are not okay to hold um, or to a political position or start a political power. Things such as youth quotas, lower eligibility ages, proportional representation, networks of young MPs, youth parliaments, and inclusive parliaments are all factors that can increase the number of youth MPs. But how do we get there? In part, thanks to intergenerational dialogue. 
I'd just like to talk a little bit more about ageism, especially impact of ageism. So um, as you can see based on what I, I've said in the video, ageism affects many areas of one's life and therefore how society functions. Ageism can also interact with other isms, such as sexism and racism, and exacerbates differences. Ageism per perpetrates misconceptions and influences the policies we develop and the opportunities that we create or we don't create. And most importantly for the context of our discussion today, ageism can also pit one generation against another, can devalue or limit our ability to benefit from what younger and older populations can contribute to addressing shared challenges. So how do we combat ageism? This is my last slide on ageism. I'm sorry, I'm passionate about ageism, so <laughs> there's a lot of slides on this, but it's my last one. Um, so there's a report that was published last, last year. It's called the UN Global Report on Ageism, and they suggest three mutually reinforcing strategies. First, um, policies and law can address discrimination and inequality on the basis of age and protect the human rights of everyone. Second, educational interventions include instructions that transmit information, knowledge, and skills, as well as activities to enhance empathy through role-playing, simulation, and virtual reality, and we saw great examples of that uh, in the video. And third, um, intergenerational interventions, which bring together people of different uh, generations to help reduce prejudice and stereotypes. These are most, uh, among the most effective uh, interventions to, re to reduce ageism against older people, and they also show promise for reducing ageism against younger people. So together, these three um, strategies can change the narrative. It, they can create more positive and more accurate narratives. So culture is fluid. Look at the changes that the women have experienced uh, in the past decade. So as you can see, ageism can be combated by intergenerational interventions. However, there's much more benefits to intergenerational inter interventions than uh, combating ageism. So I just told you a little lie. That's really my last slide on ageism. So if you're interested in the topic, I invite you to read the UN Global Report on Ageism, which was produced by WHO, the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, and the department that I, I work with. It's a fascinating report. So now let's talk a little bit about um, intergenerational dialogue. So now that we understand that uh, what ageism is and how it relates to intergenerational dialogue, let's explore how intergenerational dialogue is a great tool to help with three aspects linked to building a future together. Of course, this is just like a quick snapshot of how intergenerational dialogue can help build a future, so please do not see these three points as ex exhaustive. Um, so before I go any further, let me just say that the term intergenerational dialogue is generally understood as meaning interactive discussions and exchanges through which all ages, all generations, can share experience, knowledge, and viewpoint on an equal footing. And in the video, that, that was clear that this is what was happening. So it's not a question of a generation talking to another and the other listening, or it's not a question of a generation generation teaching another, and the other one just being the recipient of the, uh, the, um, the information. It's really a mutual exchange uh, of views on a topic. And also the concept of intergenerational solidarity, which is important because it is uh, complementary. So basically it's social cohesion uh, between generation. It can also be seen as uh, working together to address a joint issue. So intergener intergenerational solidarity is a little bit more about um, actions. And later on, I will talk about the concept of intergenerational uh, equ equity. Um, so let me go back to the three things that uh, intergenerational dialogue can help with in general, but even more when it comes to building the future. So first, intergenerational dialogue can help you uh, increase youth political participation. Second, it can help foster better policy making and better decision making. And third, it can help foster longer term thinking. So let's go back to the first point, which was addressing obstacle to participation. And that's on a second topic that I'm passionate about, so bear with me for the next couple of minutes. Um, so young people are often accused of um, uh, suffering from political apathy, meaning they don't have interest in politics. But are they really? 
On the recent, over the recent past, in all corners of the world, people have been calling for increased inclusion in their political and public institutions. Inclusiveness is something critical here because people will not trust institutions if they do not feel represented by them. So also, if a group is not represented in political or public institution, that group might start to question the legitimacy of that institution. Also, contrary to popular belief, institutional legitimacy is not a permanent condition. Increased pressure from civil society and especially young people is generating changes, setting new precedents. That's pretty exciting to, to see. Protest movements around the world have shown that the legitimacy of public and political institutions increasingly hinges on the capacity to meaningfully engage diverse, group, diverse groups especially including young people. I should have here that this is a phenomenon not just at the local national level, but also at the multilateral level, including the UN and all other members of the multilateral system. You'd say that they do not feel represented in the multilateral system and they're calling for major changes and we are listening. So if youth are not engaging in traditional political and public institutions, what are they doing? In many cases, they are creating and engaging in their own platforms. They create and use alternative channels and platforms. An example of these alternative platform is online engagement, and one of the young men mentioned that in the, in the video. So, and so online, platform, online engagement facilitates youth participation in individual or collective actions to improve the well-being of their communities. Online, online youth movements are increasingly powerful and able to influence or shape the public and political discourse on a global issue. Um, remember during the Arab Spring, the importance of online mobilization, how it shaped the Arab Spring movement. Um, another example is the creation of the Youth Climate Action Movement. Uh, young people calling for climate action made clear their discontent with how public institutions were engaging or not engaging on this issue. And the Youth Climate Action Movement had the opportunity to make its voice heard internationally and gain space in high-level gatherings, including at the United Nations. Maybe you remember when Greta Thunberg came uh, to the UN and made that face when she she saw Donald Trump walk by, so she was there for the Climate Action uh, Initiative. So young people often tend to turn away from traditional channels of political participation and engage in alternative forms, not because of a lack of interest in politics, not because of political apathy, but because of the frustrations with formal channels that might be ineffective and outdated. Some of these frustrations are linked to ageism, as we have seen before, lack of experience, is an ageist stereotype that is often cited when it comes to youth and politics. Youth are being told, wait for your turn. You know, you don't know anything about that. Youth are the future, but that's, that's not true. Yet participation of young people in formal and traditional political channels is crucial. Research shows that young politicians generate more inclusive and forward-looking practices and policies in many spheres. We absolutely need to bring youth into the traditional political channels and ensure they can access the space they have the right to hold. We need to use intergenerational dialogue to address the ageist stereotypes about youth and politics. And intergenerational dialogue is a powerful tool to challenge social perceptions, biases, and norms linked to youth and politics. And here I just want to be clear. I'm not saying that barriers to youth political participation is just a question of perception, biases, or norms. It is very much a question of structural or institutional barriers that prevent young people from running for political office and other forms of representation. This is the age of candidacy issue that I, I mentioned before. And people may fail to recognize the existence of institutional ageism because the rules, the norms, and the practices of the political and public institutions are long-standing and have rarely been questioned. Second thing that intergenerational dialogue can help is foster better policy and decision-making. As we have just discussed, underrepresentation of youth in political and public spheres and therefore overrepresentation of older political leaders matters because this imbalance in leadership provides older generations with greater opportunities to shape policies around issues that impact youth. 
using intergenerational dialogue to set political agendas not only increases the fairness in decision making, but also encourage a shift toward more sustainable solutions. In addition, intergenerational dialogue is a way to foster inclusive policy making, meaning that the process is transparent, evidence driven, accessible, and responsive to a wide range of citizens. Concretely, what does that mean? There is evidence that inclusive policy making increases policy performance, fosters accountability, and builds civic, civic capacity. I need here to say that there's not a lot of research on the benefit of in, benefits of including youth in policy making, but we can borrow from the research that was done on the benefits of including women in politics, policy making, and peace processes. For example, there's ample evidence that suggests that when women are involved in uh, political peace processes, the duration of the peace agreement is much longer than when they're not. So that's been proven without a doubt. There's also evidence that women's political participation results in tangible gains for democracy, including greater responsiveness to citizen needs, as well as increased participation across party lines and ethnic lines. So I hope that one day we have more data on youth inclusion in, in politics and, and policy makings. Um, and so if you have any <laughs> information on that or if your organization is working on that, please uh, let me know. And the third and last point I wanted to make on um, the, the importance of intergenerational dialogue is the fact that uh, it can help um, set up the stage for longer term thinking. As you might be aware, national and international policy, maker, uh, policy making is mostly focused on short term thinking, guided by electoral cycles and a focus on immediate profit. I'm not saying that's the case here, but it does happen. Uh, many of those in power spend so much of their time defending their incumbency that their policy making is primarily focused on gaining or retaining votes. That's fairly common. Also, we live in a world characterized by constant acceleration, increased volatility, rapidly shifting political dynamics. This also contributes to pushing policy making to focus on immediate solutions, sometimes and often at the cost of the next generations. At the same time, our capacity to predict the future is growing, such as, for example, climate modeling, giving us data-based scenario until the end of the 21st century. So this knowledge about the future needs to become a source of action. It's time to place long-term analysis, planning, and thinking at the head of our policy making and governance. When we, when we focus on strategic foresight, preparedness for catastrophic risk, and anticipatory decision making that values in, instead of discount the future, we will be in a much better place. And here I just want to say that language can be tricky. You know, when we talk about the future, a lot of people don't feel concerned. But when we start to talk about future generation, it gets a little bit closer to home. But then when we talk about our children, our grandchildren, oh, now, now we're concerned. So language here, the use of language is, is very important when, when you talk about um, intergenerational uh, dialogue. Um, so I said earlier that I was going to talk about intergenerational uh, equity. So intergener intergenerational equity means recognizing our responsibilities toward future generation and making decisions with their interest in mind. Some people call this inter intergenerational justice, which is something that you might have heard in the past. Future generations are, by definition, not represented in today's decision making and unable to articulate their needs and interests. Yet we need to keep them in mind when we make decisions. Concretely, what does that mean? At the national level, some countries have established committees for the future or future generations commissioners who advise governments and public bodies on the effect of present decisions, uh, the effect of present decisions on people of the future. There's a, quite a number of countries who have this, this model. Um, at the multilateral system, a growing number of member states and advocates have proposed options to represent future generation in the UN system, including through a possible special envoy for future generations. So the final part of my presentation is about a couple of examples and good practices. And I always hesitate to give example to uh, people because sometimes I feel it limits their, their um, uh, creativity. 
Um, so there's a couple of examples on the next slide. So in Finland, there's a life cycle impact assessment tool which looks at policies to make sure that there's not a bias through one generation. In Uganda, they had a very interesting model where they use community um, theater um, with actors of different generations to convey a message on climate change. Uh, in Canada, there's, a there's an organization called Generation Squeeze. I think they, they should win the best, the name for best uh, organization's name, uh, who advises the Canadian government on how to make sure that their policies are fair across generation. Um, and the last example is um, something that we manage um, at the d department where I work, which is the inclusion of young people as official delegates, uh, uh, like member states delegation. So they come to the General Assembly and they talk on behalf of um, member states. And I will conclude with a couple of good um, practices. Um, on intergeneration, intergenerational dialogue. So these models are located on a continuum uh, or a spectrum of social contracts with varying degrees of, of strengths. Um, so intergenerational dialogue can be anchored in very weak social contracts, such as, for example, okay, I'll talk to you, I'll consult you, I'll, I'll listen to your advice, but I'll be the one making a decision. So that's like a fairly weak social contract all the way down to the other end of the spectrum where there, it's shared leadership, that where we make decisions together. Um, so here you have a couple of examples. Some of them are related to um, the examples from the four countries that I mentioned before. Um, there's one that is, I also mentioned before, is youth uh, quotas in political participation. And there are a few more examples. And I, I had meetings with uh, people from the region uh, this morning. I can see that there's a lot of these things that are already being done, intergenerational dialogue in uh, the context of school, um, you know, online interaction, funding opportunities projects, community-based projects that receive funding. Um, and last important, which is very important for, for me because of the lack of data that we have on the topic, is collection of, of data uh, by public officials. Um, so these um, good practices are also included in the, the UN Global Report on Ageism that I mentioned. So this is what I wanted to share uh, with you today. I hope that this is helpful um, when you think about how we can work together to build the future and basically renegotiate a social contract and new ways to share power, new ways to generate shared leadership. As a famous political researcher said, if we can fix relations between generations, we can address every issue facing us. And I'm a firm believer in this. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thanks to you, Isabelle Le yes. May I ask you to take a seat? Yeah, the second one, please. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your presentation and for sharing your, your ideas and your uh, examples so that we can, well, get new ideas to boost uh, youth participation and foster uh, intergenerational uh, um, dialogue. Well, as you said, it's a matter of working together to address a joint issue. Well. That seems very easy, but as you said, the obstacles <laughs> put it very, <laughs> quite difficult. <laughs> well, now we're going to dig into all you said, and we are going to invite other speakers. First of all, llamamos a Mikel Mancisidor nuevamente, que por cierto, eh, vamos a presentarte ahora antes eh, con las prisas, ¿no? Entre los vídeos y tal. Uh, Mikel Mancisidor, eres eh, miembro del Comité de Derechos Económicos, Sociales y Culturales de Naciones Unidas. We have Mikkel here. He's a member of the United Nations Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, a lecturer in international law at the University of Dusto, and a member of Etorkisuna Eiraikis. And we would also like to invite two of the people who we saw in the video, Aner and Iñaki. Aner Unanue and Iñaki Garcia. So welcome to both of you as well. Así que bueno, vamos a abrir. Okay, we're just going. Well, welcome first of all before we start. Bueno, hemos escuchado, os hemos escuchado. So, we've listened to you. We've heard you in the video and you're here now with us. And now we are we are receiving questions from the floor from the public, so we'll need to leave space for that as well. 
Uh, you can send in your questions through the Gipuzkoa events application. And uh, you can you can just click on the dialogue with Isabel and uh, you can ask your questions there. So Mika, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isabel, for your presentation. Oh, you've uh, talked about so many ideas. I like the first silhouette that uh, we saw. The silhouette that, I don't know if you remember, right at the beginning of her presentation, she talked about stereotypes, prejudices, about how we feel, and then discrimination is how we act. She explained that. Why did I like the silhouette? Well, um, because it, it's it, we would have sort of otherwise we, we'd have thought that other people have stereotypes but not us but when we see a silhouette we sort of think oh we have them as well so what are the stereotypes that we have i really like that that really helped me to ask me that my question what are the stereotypes and prejudices that i have but it's also a bit of a, a provocation because I wanted to see if there was a stereotype in the presentation itself and just to be a bit provocative don't take it the wrong way but there was the idea that um, the mentality or long-term thinking is something that young people do more than old people seems a bit contradiction oh well, it seems logical in a way because they're going to be living for longer whereas as we get older we don't need to think so much in the long term so it should be something that interests young people more than older people but in practice is that always the case or do we not also think sometimes that maybe uh, older people have a, a longer term view I'm, I'm just asking i'm not stating anything i'm just questioning that uh, you know, because it's an old man who always plants a tree that's going to provide shade a hundred years down the line, whereas young people sort of want things to be more immediate. They're sort of used to living in this immediate society. Do you think there's a bit of a stereotype there as well about uh, maybe when we think that thinking in the long term is something that young people do, but in practice it's not always like that? Other aspects of the presentation that I think that touch on the heart of what we're trying to do here is uh, when you talked about uh, political apathy. Mm. Uh, is it apathy really? I mean, you questioned that, right? Uh, but there is a distance of young people. They're, they're distant from traditional politics as well, or politics as we have traditionally understood it. There, there seem to be a gap between them and political parties, for example. And another very interesting aspect that also came up time and time again in the video was what you called equity. Uh, intergenerational equity. Uh, in the video we talked about uh, pensions, we could also talk about public debt. Yeah, I mean, who's going to actually have to pay back that debt? Well, probably young people. So my role here is not to give another presentation but just to introduce the debate. I just want to mention something else that perhaps we can talk about and that is education. You've said that in order to carry out or to foster this type of dialogue and fight against these stereotypes, we need policies, rules, and dialogue, but we also need to work on education. That's what you said. Perhaps you can talk a little bit about that. Do you, is there any experience that has to do with education? I imagine that there's quite a lot of people here who work in the educational field. First, I just need to say that I like um, provocative questions, so <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so when it comes to education, uh, one practice that's happening in schools that is really proven to be really impact impactful is role play. And so there's a lot of research on you know, uh, bringing people from different generations into the classroom and playing the role, the, the reverse role. And that has been um, researched and proven as being very effective in debunking some of the stereotypes that younger people have about older people and, and vice versa. So role playing in school is a great uh, model. Um, and the, the beauty with the educational um, solutions that are suggested in, in that report is the fact that they can be customized according to the local context or um, to the, you know, the objective, the specific objective that is um, conveyed in, in the school. So there's, and that's why I'm hesitant to give examples because it reduces a, a, a little bit um, what, you know, what people think that is the, the, a good approach to, to say. Uh, but yeah, role playing is, is great and also examining 
um, textbooks or stories that are shared in school, deconstructing them to identify stereotypes. And that's an exercise that was done in quite a number of schools, and uh, teachers realized that some of the books that they read to the, even the little ones, like in kindergarten, were basically already reinforcing stereotypes. So looking at a, a book or a story through the lens of um, intergenerational dialogue and also ageism allowed a lot of teachers to make better choices uh, in terms of the books that they were sharing with uh, kids. So that's just two, two examples, but like I said, there's like a plethora of, of models that can be applied to the education um, sector. Okay, thank you. Right, the best thing that we can do really is to learn by doing, I think. Uh, everything that has to do with intergenerational dialogue. And then would you like to say something, Aner? Well, I don't know if this is an issue that has been... I don't think you mentioned it too much in your presentation, but I do have a doubt. You come from the UN, and I'm sure uh, you're aware of what's going on in different countries. So my question is the following. This gap that you talked about the, the gap is it the same everywhere or is it greater in some countries than in other countries and what 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 influences that why is the generation of gap different in one country than another is it cultural is it linguistic is it political decisions what is it that affects that i missed the beginning of the question so you're talking about the political apathy Yes, I was asking about uh, that the gap between different generation, generations, uh, if it is uh, the same between countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. Um, so I mentioned also in my presentation that um, ageism against young people is not yet sufficiently researched. We don't have a lot of data for all over the world. There's a little bit more data on, on Europe than other countries. So first, what I'm about to say is anchored in the fact that we need more research to better understand um, ageism in different, in different regions. But um, what is reported by young people, so their lived experience, demonstrates that there's quite a number of difference across countries, uh, even uh, across regions and even across uh, countries. So ageism is very much uh, anchored into the local context, even sometimes at the community or the family level. So there's many layers that can influence the shape that um, ageism will, will take. So the short answer is no, but the longer an answer is that we need more research to be able to qualify exactly how it's different and how it's similar. Thank you. Iñaki, Iñaki, would you like to say anything? Well, first of all, thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity for being here, the opportunity to be here. Now, when we're talking about the intergenerational gap and intergenerational dialogue, before we talked perhaps about a gap, um, I don't know, between people who are age 20 and people who are age 60, but today with life expectancy, these, this gap is getting bigger because we're getting older. So it's not the same as it was. I mean, the difference that might exist between myself and Aner, who's sitting next to me, than maybe uh, I might have uh, with someone who's 85 years of age, who we're, complete, we're talking completely different languages. So I don't know, what, what, can you give us any advice about that, or do you have any comments about that? That, that's a very important point, and I think I might have skipped that point in my, in my presentation. Um, we're very much aware that being 25 in 2022 is very different from being 25 in 1960s. You know, it's completely different a period. Also, youth, being a young person, varies quite a lot um, depending on a lot of other contexts, such as you know, economic um, insertion, social insertion. So the transition of being a young person can be shorter or longer depending on where you are um, in terms of countries, in terms of region, but also where you are economically and, so, and socially. Um, so 
there, there is a lot of variation um, on, on, on this topic. And again, it goes back to the fact that we don't have a lot of data. We need to better research it. Um, the data that we have right now is what young people uh, report to us. And we can already see a lot of variety, but I'm sure that if we have more information, we'll be able to find uh, trends. And it's only when we better understand the phenomenon, I think that we'll be in the best position to give advice on how to, to address this. It's, this topic is a, a topic that is fairly new um, and needs to be better researched. We're just in the awareness raising uh, phase. Right, we're getting some questions from the floor to Isabel, so I'm going to read them out now. One question is, do you believe that in public administrations and among politicians, do you think politicians are actually willing to listen and accept what young people say but really truly do you think they're willing to actually give young people the opportunity defending the young people rather than defending their own political parties because you're up there sort of a watchtower you've got a very overall vision so what do you think uh, uh, do you see the administrations and uh, politicians ready to let young people in, into the power, so that they can also make policies. I will give an answer, and hopefully I won't get into trouble um, for that. So, generally speaking, there is an increasing uh, willingness to open the door to, to young people. It's, this is happening after many years of advocacy work, ad, you know, uh, trying to ask member states to be a little bit more um, you know, open to young people. It started quite a long time ago with just being aware of what a youth is and then to, you know, let them participate a little bit, then engage them, which is a little bit more active. So as the years gone by, the awareness of member states about uh, the importance of youth development and youth empowerment has increased. Uh, but now we're at the stage where we're going toward specific actions and sharing power, and it's very sensitive. Um, but it's definitely going in the right direction, but there's still a little bit of, of you know... It's still um, at the willingness point. <laughs> yeah, but the actions are not, you know... It, it, I'm talking in general, there's a lot of great examples, um, but generally speaking, there's still a lot of fight for keeping the way things were in the past, um, but we're moving in the right direction. So there's more work that needs to, to be yeah. done. But then, uh, older people say that young people, are, they're always on Twitter, they're not doing anything, but maybe they just don't have any other options. It may be. I don't know. I'm just saying in general. I don't know if that's true. Uh, there's perhaps another very brief question. Account for young people uh, feelings of apathy toward politics, the lack of opportunities in a market occupied already by baby boomers. Uh. Es que Gal, o sea, es la primera vez que lo leo y la verdad es que no lo no no. no. Yes, I read the question. That was the first time I read the question. I don't really understand it very well. Let me just read it again, see if I can understand what it actually means. Can you hear the translation now, Isabel? So there's a lack of opportunities. So this apathy that we talk about, or the apathy that young people are accused of having, is it really apathy or is it just a lack of opportunities? Perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> a few last uh, words in order to finish the... Yeah, maybe we can ask young people, but I, I don't think it's apathy. I think it's lack of access. And the young people are creating opportunities somewhere else, on social media, through social entrepreneurship, to participation in, in you know, social uh, capital projects. But it's just because they're knocking at the door of traditional uh, political platforms and the door uh, is not open, sufficiently open. So, so I really don't think it's apathy. I think it's lack of They are of creating access. their own platforms, exactly, actually. Exactly. So but a new world is coming. Yeah, but I think young people can better answer. Yeah, I think that are both questions that there, there is, I think that a part is the lack of uh, access, but also I think that the, the young people is changing the ways of doing politics and moving the power 
from the parliament to Twitter can be, like for, to social media. And I think that with the time we will see a change in, in the places where decisions are taken. Right, well that's a very powerful idea to finish off with. Difficult idea as well. Because the question of political legitimacy of different spaces is another issue. Uh, but we don't have time uh, to talk about that, unfortunately, because we only have 15 minutes and uh, those 15 minutes are up. So thank you to all of you, especially to Isabel, who's, you know, uh, been uh, exposed to this sort of attacks on all fronts. But thank you all very much. Thank you especially to you, Isabel. Right, I will invite you to please retake your seats. Thank you very much, Iñaki, Aner, Isabel and Mikel. Right, well, after looking at the most more international side of things, and we've got some ideas about how we can reduce the intergenerational gap, we're going to just come closer to home and to see uh, what's being done closer to home uh, to try to close the gap between generations and to foster gener intergenerational um, dialogue. And we don't have to go very far, we just have to go to Legazpi. And we have Koldavike and Maria Ruiz, both of them from Legazpi. And they are coordinating uh, this, uh, this initiative. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. So, we often say uh, that Legazpi, in Legazpi you are pioneers in social policies. We often say that. You're also pioneers in fostering intergenerational contact and intergenerational experiences. So, you're going to talk to us about your experience. The floor is all yours. Well, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to be here today to talk about this experiment that we're carrying out in the town of Legazpi. We are pioneers in social policies. Uh, 40 years ago in Legazpi, we set up the uh, home service uh, for a home service for um, older people in uh, 1984, we built the uh, retirement home, which is today the civic centre, the social centre. In 1998, we have 22 assisted living apartments, and today we have a budget of 11 million euros. And of this 11 million euros, 20.5% are earmarked for social policies. We have a day centre, uh, we have a day care centre as well. We have different projects uh, to try to fight against uh, unwanted loneliness or, or um, And we are pioneers. There are, in Legazpi, there are 8,400 inhabitants. And 26.3% of them are over 65 years of age. And 34.4% of the population of our municipality is older than 60 years. So we have a fairly aged population. I think we are perhaps the most aged population in Gipuzkoa. And this generates certain necessities and certain needs. In 2018, we had the opportunity, uh, we had a, a very op interesting opportunity uh, cropped up. We were able to buy an entire building. At uh, the time, we thought it would be a good place to offer our social services, not just to older people, but for, to young people as well. Because, as we said before, um, we have lots of uh, young people who have, I don't know, three degrees, four masters, they speak five languages, they're incredibly well qualified, but when they actually get their first job, they have a really, really low wage and they simply can't afford to buy a house. 
So we thought, well, perhaps we could, you know, generate projects, co-housing projects. Um, and we have assisted living for older people, but maybe we thought perhaps we could take into account young people as well um, and offer them housing at a, a low uh, rent so that uh, they could live there during the early years of their career, their professional career. We didn't really know how to do that. So we went to the Provincial Council of Gipuzkoa and they got us in touch with the foundation called Adin Berri. And they said that they wanted to experiment with an intergenerational project and we decided to participate. So we're quite daring, we're quite audacious and we decided to just, you know, fling ourselves into the fray. Uh, and Maria is here. She is um, a representative of ISEA, which is a cooperative which has helped us. She's actually the same age as my daughter. So you can see that we are, in fact, collaborating intergenerationally. Well, I think uh, Kolobike has described our context very well. And this is the context in which uh, this project uh, is located. It's a project led by ISEA. And the aim is to create an intergenerational space where we can um, transmit knowledge and to foster the intergenerational bond through collaboration, uh, active aging. And to do that, we wanted to um, set up uh, or to enable an intergenerational cooperation and experimentation through this space that we have set up. And in this space, we can carry out different actions and different activities. That we've had to obviously uh, identify. We wanted it to be a space for individual and shared leisure activities. Um, we wanted to have it be a place for exchanging knowledge, etc., for team working as a team and shared management. And uh, how has it gone? Have you done all of this? Have you approached it? Yes, well, we have worked uh, with citizens, but mainly through the associations that we have. Uh, we set up the Gesarte Lab. Uh, project which are sort of social laboratories and we work with the provincial council and in 2019 um, when we still didn't have this intergenerational project but back before then the provincial council suggested that what we might want to do is to create a sort of space for reflection um, with people aged between 45 and 55 years of age so we created this group of people uh, with representatives from different uh, political groups and also representatives from different associations from the municipality. Uh, sporting associations, cultural associations, and then we started to work. And then uh, when we started with the inter inter intergenerational project, we saw that there were stereotypes, prejudices, and we saw that in order to create this intergenerational space in the civic centre, that what used to be the retirement home and is now the civic centre, we had a really useful space and we, we could do it all there. We realised that there was a space available for that. So uh, we also set up a second Gisarte Lab project with the help of the Provincial Council. And in this group that was who'd participated in the first group, but well, we rung them again, um, the Retirement Association, uh, Usilan Association, uh, Women's Associations and other people as well. And we called them and we set them a challenge. What was the challenge? Well, we said, right, you need to get this intergenerational space up and running. But obviously, first of all, we had to identify the stereotypes that we were trying to overcome. So we said, so, OK, so what are the stereotypes that we need to overcome in order to set up this intergenerational space? Well, we identified a series of actions, uh, experimental actions, and now our aim is to uh, set up a third Gisartela because people are really happy with it. As well as participating, people learn when they do this. In these projects, people learn. And in this case, we use uh, the methodology used by Usko Ekaskunsa. Uh, we, we offer knowledge, but we also acquire certain skills. And the meetings last for about two hours and we always share some kind of thought, a reflection. Uh, we give each other food for thought and uh, it's a really good opportunity to learn different methodologies and people are really happy and they participate. Well, I know that that's true because different studies have shown that groups that have people from different generations are more efficient. They're more effective 
Yes, in the case of ISEA, at the beginning of the project, we did carry out an international study to try to see what other countries had done or what had been done in other countries, what good practices or best practices were out there. And we saw that in the northern European countries, this type of initiative already existed and they had existed for some time. So I think we can say that they that it was sort of like a springboard for our success. Uh, it's really important uh, to... to in achieve participation for these projects to be a success and as well as everything that we've mentioned so far we should also say that uh, students from the University of Mondragon also participated. These are people who had just uh, finished uh, an engineering degree and were studying a design master's degree and we also worked with students from the University of the Basque Country from the design centre at that university and all of these students, these graduates, have helped us to design this space so that it really is an intergenerational space and they said something which was quite curious, they said to us a space like this needed to have a place that was Instagrammable in order to attract young people. I thought that was quite curious because, uh, of course, you know, well, how does Instagram work? I don't know. Uh, but they said, OK, well, it has to be a place where we can take photos so that we can upload them to social media or in TikTok. And this is something that we didn't have and we hadn't even taken into consideration. We have to attract young people. And uh, they said this could sort of, you know, like be a hook on the end of your fishing line to bring young people in. One of the keys to the project has been collaboration and that's why Kolobike was saying that uh, we've been working with different institutions, different institutions have been working together, public-private associations, we've also been working with university students. Because at the end of the day, we said if it's a project for citizens, uh, we need to have different stakeholders involved. And thanks to university students from Mondragon, we carried out a brainstorming session. We generated lots of ideas to try to promote different actions and activities in this new space, in this new center. And then with the students from Iriarte, the design center in the University of the Basque Country, um, we, we have given shape to this, uh, to this space, and to sort of break through and debunk the sort of the stigma that was that was holding us back, the stigma. So, um, you've done fantastic work. But is the space up and running? No, not yet. It's just been identified. What do we need to do now? Well, students have designed us a designed a space, but we actually have to make it a reality. It's fantastic. No, you must be really eager to see this space, you know, with your own eyes, because the experience so far is being very rewarding. Yes, the experience so far is incredibly rewarding. It's an experiment. Uh, it's trial and error. We started with this project when we thought that in the building that uh, I was talking about, we could create an intergenerational space. And then the, inter the university student said, no, you can't do it there. It has to be in the, the civic center. This is what happens with experimentation. It's trial and error. You try something, it doesn't work. You change track and try something else. That's just what you have to do. You have to be flexible and adaptable. And now uh, we're thinking of setting up another Guisarte lab, another social laboratory because we want all the ideas uh, that we've been working on to become reality and they want to turn them into actual actions. Now, in principle, uh, right from the very beginning, we thought about the scalability of the project. We wanted it to be a project that is repeated in different municipalities in Gipuzkoa, and we could actually create a model for a public-private space that can be copied and adapted to different places or that could be transferred to different places. So that's what I was actually going to ask you to just close uh, this particular part of today's session. Have you, uh, I don't know, has, have other places called you wanting to copy your idea? Well, in the case of Gipuzkoa, the provincial council set up a project which aimed to promote collaborative governance. And uh, what has that taught us? Well, it's taught us that there is another way of governing, that there are different ways of governing. And that you can govern openly, in an open manner. And that's what they've taught us. They've taught us that there are different ways of governing. This is what the provincial council is doing with a number of different local councils. And that's what we're trying to do also in our municipalities. In Etorquez Unireikis, Building the Future, there's a project in which 11 municipalities are involved. And the different experiences that we're carrying out in our different municipal municipalities, we share them with other municipalities so that we can learn from each other. And if it works in one, well, we'd adapt it to ours. 
So we sort of make the most of the work carried out by one municipality so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel every day. That's what's good about this. We experiment and if something works, then we copy it, we scale it up and we, you know, disseminate it to other municipalities. So from Legathby to the Basque Country to the world and back to Legathby again. Thank you very much indeed and congratulations to both of you. Bueno, eta Legazpitik Suitzara joko dugu. Right, and from Legazpi to Switzerland. I think on the other side of the screen we have our two guests. We have Lady and Agnes. And we're going to now learn about the fantastic work being carried out by an NGO in Switzerland uh, where we have two Spaniards working. It's called Child Rights Connect and it is fostering the participation of children and young people uh, through different practices which aim to empower them. So, good afternoon, Lady Ibanez and Agnes Gracia. Hello, good afternoon, can you hear us okay? Yes, we can hear you perfectly, thank you very much. The floor's all yours, we're eager to hear what you're doing. Thank you very much and I would like to start by thanking you all for inviting Child Rights Connect to form part of this session. It's a pleasure for us to be here to share with you our practices, our examples and to be part of this debate. I'm going to start by explaining what Child Rights Connect is and what we do. So can we pass on to the next slide please? So what is it? Oh, well it's a network of NGOs. There's a small secretariat in Switzerland, but we're basically a network of NGOs. There are more than 19, 90 sorry, NGOs in the network. And when the UN Convention on Child Rights uh, was beginning to develop, well, this was when many of the NGOs were established. So as a network, we influenced uh, this text so that the convention has very strong uh, standards for protecting child rights. And once the convention was adopted, uh, we became strategic uh, members of the, ch the, the Child's Committee, which is the committee, uh, the UN committee, which uh, makes sure that the convention is being respected. And our aim, our main aim, is that we want to support everyone, everyone who wants to participate in the uh, work carried out by the Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, to see whether or not the Convention is being respected or not. But we go one step further as well and what we want is that when the UN talks about the standards that have to do with child rights, we want to be there. We're there, we're monitoring these standards, we want to make sure that they're strict, we want to make sure that they're not regressive, always trying to improve child rights. And one thing that we do that's very important is that we believe that all debates, all discussions about child rights uh, needs to be carried out, uh, taking into account the opinions and the voices of children themselves both boys and girls. And this is where uh, the importance of this intergenerational dialogue comes in. This is why it's so important, because we need to listen to children, even very young children. They need to be a part of all debates that may affect them. Right, let's continue now a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the progress that has been made and some of the challenges ahead of us and then Lady uh, will be talking about some specific examples about how from Child's Rights Connect we're trying to forge a connection between the UN and the different mechanisms within the UN and, diff and children at a local level. So I'd like to start by asking, what do we mean when we talk about children? Well, we're talking about all of those people who are under the age of 18, which is uh, what the uh, UN Convention describes children as, everyone under the age of 18. I think this really ties in very well with what we've heard today because we've been talking a lot about barriers and obstacles in the path of young people. And we uh, focus specifically on this particular uh, population group, children, the smallest, the youngest members of society who really, really do need everyone's support uh, in order to make their voices heard. 
And really what we believe is that involving the youngest people, members of our society in debates and creating spaces for them right from the beginning of their lives will help make sure that they in their later on in life will be active citizens, committed citizens, civic minded citizens so that they can contribute uh, to ensuring a more sustainable type of governance. I would just like to say that the Convention on the Rights of the Child has an article which says that children should be listened to and that their opinions should be taken into account during the decision-making process. Now, this is extremely important because it's a right. It's children's rights. It's a right that we all need to make sure is respected. And it's really important that state, regional and local authorities see... Uh, this is part of their obligation. As part of their obligation, they need to create spaces for children. And often we hear a lot of authorities and governments who are scared and they don't know how to do it. How can we do that? How can we involve them? How can we listen to them? There's a lot of stereotypes. This is what we've heard already today. Will children really be able to understand what we're talking about? Will they? I don't know. Do you not think that... I, we don't think they're going to have a valid opinion. There's a lot of fear a fear about asking children what their opinion is. And many people think, well, they're not going to understand what we're talking about. It's really technical. But we've seen that that's not true with our own eyes. That children always have something to say and their opinions are really important. And it's important that all authorities uh, keep this or, or take notice of, of these opinions. And we shouldn't be scared about asking children what they think. You just need to find the right way to find to create spaces for them so that they can contribute to the decision-making process. Now, what I'd like to share with you now is our experience asking children uh, about what challenges they see uh, when they think about joining in with society, raising their voices and contributing to debate. In 2018, we supported the, uh, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child to uh, organise what was called a General Debate Day. This Every two years, the UN organises debate on an important issue, uh, an issue that needs to be discussed because it's not being discussed, it's not being debated, it's not being analysed. It's not being developed and understood by society. In 2018, they decided to hold the debate um, and it was focusing on uh, children as defenders of human rights, children as activists, children as people who raise their voices and contribute to society. Now, we've seen child activists. Um, we've seen children who are really really heading up the fight against climate change, children who are going out and protesting on the street all over the world, uh, trying to improve education, for example. And we're talking about very young children who sometimes uh, go out on the street to protest. So we supported the committee so that we could hear all these children, these child activists who wanted to share their opinions. And we asked them about what the main challenges were. And we carried out a survey with over 3,000 children all over the world from every single region of the world, where there are all sorts of different values and barriers. But what we did see, that there was also a lot of similarities between uh, the answers of all of these children. And one of the main barriers that they talked about was the fact that many people, uh, adults, don't take them seriously. Even if they try to express their opinion, their opinion, adults don't tend to take them seriously and they don't listen to them. And many just think that they should be passive stakeholders and they should just uh, just obey the rules of society and that's it and not be activists. So this was one of the challenges that many children all over the world identified. They also said that they don't feel safe that they, they're scared about giving their opinion because they think people are going to laugh at them or that people are going to threaten them or punish them or, or just going to be told to shut up, basically, that their opinion doesn't matter. So from right from the world go, right from very young age, they feel this lack of safety, security, and then there's not, they're not feeling empowered by society. They also said that they didn't feel informed that we don't make information accessible and available to them using uh, an easy to understand language, child friendly language, or using the right types of uh, media, the media that they use. They feel that there's a lack of information 
and that we all have a responsibility to create information that can be understood by them. them. And then finally, and we saw this when we saw the video, and this is something that's come up in the debate as well. Uh, they said that there were no spaces for them. There was no spaces for them to express their opinion and contribute to the decision-making process. There are very few spaces. And this is uh, our responsibility to create those spaces for children to express their opinion. So uh, from In Child Rights Connect, how do we go about creating these spaces to support other people so that they can also create spaces for child participation? Well, first of all, in our organisation, we have a, a team uh, which provides advice, or we have a child advisory team. We have a series, of, a, a group of children uh, between 10 and 12, I think she said, and we consult them every time we want to carry out an activity. And every time we want to go to the UN, and say, look, we think that these standards should be improved. Uh, we want to, every time we want to take children's voices to the UN, we consult them. And they actually form part of our executive committee. So when we're making decisions about where the NGO is going to be heading, uh, children from different countries all over the world uh, give us their opinion. And they, they give us feedback on these different activities. Now, this is unique. And this is something that... Uh, I think an activity, I don't know, an NGO or even a state organisation or a region organisation can do. It's something that can be copied by at any level. They could create a child advisory board. It's very easy to do. Now, there are lots of different practices uh, uh, with regard to participation. There are different practices at an international, national and regional, local level, uh, in local councils, for example. There are child advisory boards or child councils or youth parliaments, sometimes they're called, uh, where children from different regions can uh, participate in these types of spaces. But the most important thing is when children express their opinions, they really need to be taken into account. They need to be taken seriously. Uh, you need to ask them about specific policies, specific activities. And at a local level, it's just, it's really easy. We're going to set up, you know, there's a new playground. We're going to build a new playground. Well, let's ask the children who are going to be playing in the playground what they want. Or we're going to set up a new school. Well, let's ask children how they want the school to be, what they want it to be like. The children who are either will or may go to that school, um, ask them about what spaces they want how it should be built etc we've even seen recently that there's a country that is developing a new constitution and in fact they've been asking children about what the constitution should include and if we make child-friendly documents for children then we can ask them about all sorts of things including you know the rights that need to be enshrined in a new constitution there are no barriers really to what we can uh, talk to children about one of the specific examples that i wanted to talk about was that we have spent many years now supporting the un committee on the rights of the child to create uh, spaces and to consult children it's one of the most advanced committees in this sense in this type of practice have created new principles for safe participation, empowering participation for children uh, on an equal footing with adults. They've also created different policies uh, for safe participation that we need to take into account to ensure that children can participate in a safe way. We need to protect their personal data so that they don't feel intimidated, for example, when they participate in these types of spaces. So I would recommend that uh, if you want to involve children in what you're doing, I think there's a lot that you can learn from the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. When the committee, well, it regularly revise, it sort of looks at what, uh, how different states are, are enforcing the convention, uh, they meet children from those countries to hear directly what they think about it. So there's very good practices that you can uh, glean from what the committee does. And then finally, and there's one step forward that we've seen, uh, uh, a decision that the Secretary General uh, of the United Nations took, a decision he made recently, 
as a result of a campaign that we launched uh, from Child's Right to Connect with our members. Last year, we launched a com campaign asking the UN to work on child's rights and for them to um, consult children in a much more cross-cutting way uh, in the different committees, the different agencies that they have. Um, I mean, it's God, the UN is an incredibly complex organization. It has so many committees, so many different bodies. So we wanted to see how this um, this issue could be worked on in a much more mainstreaming way or a cross-cutting way. And the Secretary General made the decision at the end of last year to develop a set of guidelines about how to include children in a coordinated and cross-cutting way. Uh, include child rights but also child participation so we think that this is going to be a really good document that's going to come out soon it's going to be very useful not just for the UN but also for people who at a local level want to develop uh, different methodologies to consult the youngest members of society so that's all from me Uh, that's what we do to consult children and to include them in our debates. Uh, debates that are often thought of as being just for adults. And I'm going to pass the floor over to Lady, who's going to give you some very specific examples uh, in which we have consulted children. Well, thank you very much, Lady. You really need to be very, very brief because we are running out of time and we do need to close. So, Lady, we do want to hear you, but please be very, very brief. Thank you, Arracha Leon, as you say in the Basque country. Thank you very much to the organisers of this debate for having invited us to participate. My name is Lady Ibanez, and here with my colleague Agnes Gracia, I work at Child Rights Connect. In my presentation, I'm going to just give you some very brief examples of what we can do to incorporate the voice of children in different issues uh, within the UN. I don't know if we can perhaps move on to the next, I think n slide number eight, if that would be okay. Can we do that? That's perfect, thank you very much. Well, the 2018 General Debate Day. As Agnes said in 2018, uh, the General Debate Day was dedicated to protecting and empowering children as human rights advocates at a proposal uh, made by Child Rights Direct. Now, this had a long-term effect and it's still a fact that is still uh, there today. A year before the debate, we started a round of consultations to identify the challenges facing children who want to participate and we worked in close collaboration collaboration with the committee on the rights of the child and the high commissioner for human rights and the special rapporteur from the UN uh, and many other experts as well to develop new participation methodologies and in child rights connect we continue to work to disseminate the recommendations that came out of this debate and to raise awareness in the population about the importance of changing our mindset in order to strengthen existing initiatives and to empower children as human rights advocates connecting them to broader initiatives at a national regional and international level can we perhaps move on to the next slide please that would be great Child Rights Connect also works in, uh, in child engagement uh, processes, such as the Human Rights Council. Now, one emblematic case would be the annual Year on the Rights of Children and Adolescents. It's held every year in March, and there Child Rights Connect helps our members to become involved in this process. We help this dialogue to take place, creating an ad hoc group of different experts who are interested in the issue that's being debated so that we can contribute to organising the panel for this debate, including different children and also the uh, negotiation of the resolution. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Children have the right to find and understand information in a format that is child friendly. To empower them, it's really important for all the information that we provide them to be in a child friendly format. 
Now, some special uh, rapporteurs have made an effort to adapt their own documents and they publish them in a child-friendly format. So they're two good examples of this child-friendly documents of what we can see up there on the screen. For example, we have the special rapporteur for the UN uh, on the on the rights of the child and the environment. And then there's another report issued by the UN about uh, violence, about solutions to put an end to violence against children. So this is information that can be used and understood by children. If we can move on to the next slide, please. On the 5th and 6th of April this year, children from all over the world participated in the child consultations carried out by the Committee of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. This consultation well, involved a debate about sustainable development. It was an innovative experiment uh, because the committee really understood the importance of including the voices of children in a committee that really isn't used to hearing from children. Uh, because we're here we're just talking about economic, social and cultural rights. We're not talking about anything that has to do with children. And more than 160 children and young people from over 30 different countries participated in the consultation. And the participation of children was very diverse, uh, with children of very different uh, origins. Uh, immigrants, refugees, um, uh, homeless children, children with disabilities, many, many different types of children. Uh, aged between 7 and 16. And there were also some uh, people who were over 18, but they worked as facilitators. So on to the next slide, please. Now, uh, we're here, we're talking about the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, we work with organisations at a local level to include children in the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals so that we can include child's opinions in everything that we do there. And just now to conclude, if we can move on to the last two slides, that would be great. So this is uh, my conclusion now. The experience that we've explained to you today, we believe that it's the way forward if we want to ensure a greater collaboration of children in uh, decision making and deci policy making decisions in order uh, to minimize negative impacts of these policies on children. Now here we're talking about all sorts of different issues, uh, the environment, violence, etc. And in Child Rights, uh, Child Rights Connect, we try to make sure that the standards of the Convention on the Rights of the Child are recognized and enforced. And we want to work, we're working towards a safe, empowered and informed participation of children. This is AOC, a long term goal. And it will depend on the development level in each country. And that's all from me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much for having invited us to participate in this very interesting and very necessary forum. Thank you very much, Lady Agnes. That's a fantastic, for your fantastic work that you're carrying out in Child Rights Connect in Switzerland. And we hope that the UN will take into account your uh, request and really take into account the children and the wishes and the desires of children. And I think, just to conclude, I think we need to see other generations as part of the solution and not just as a problem. So now we will really be closing this forum. We hope it's been interesting, you found it interesting, and to finish it... Um, just to close, we are going to invite Mr. Marca Lolano, the president of the Gipuzkoa Provincial Council, just to come up here and say a few words of farewell. And I will say goodbye to you from here and thank you all very much for your attention. Right, it's getting late, so I'm going to try to be very brief in this closing in my closing remarks first of all thank you all very much thank you to all of you who have participated uh, the people who have been talking about intergenerational dialogue uh, the, our visitors from Legathby I think all of you have 
have been very clear. Your presentations have been really interesting and they've really helped us to understand a little bit more this issue, which is so necessary for social cohesion. I believe that this collaboration, this intergenerational dialogue is absolutely necessary for social cohesion. And really, just to finish very briefly, I would like to say that as a person who loves music, and I love the Basque band Oscorri, and the Basque band Oscorri has a song in which it says that intergenerational dialogue is necessary. And in this song, what does Oscorri say? Oscorri says that we need to pay careful attention to young people, to children. We need to bear them in mind, to take them into account. And we also have to let older people have their say, our grandparents, our grandmothers, our grandfathers. Because when we're talking about people who are old, they're not people who are old, they're people who've just lived a long time. And then with that, I will finish. Thank you all very much indeed.